Hi guys, welcome back. We are on chapter 16, page 143 of The Barren Grounds with David, by David A. Robertson. The council has just granted Ocek and the children and Eric the ability to go on their quest to find the human that took the summer birds with him. Uh, they're hoping this can bring the green time back to Mizwa and just be able to live in a, a far more balanced and healthy environment. Right now, Mizwa is in a terrible state with all of the, the beings starving. Very little food is out there to find and they are in dire needs of, of finding some help. So hopefully they can find the birds and bring back summer to Mizwa. 16. Ocek, Eric, Morgan, and Eli left without much more than they had with them on their journey to Ocek's trap line. Their packs were filled with materials for their dwelling, eating utensils, extra clothing, something that would have been useful when Morgan had lost her mitts, food, a small shovel, and so on. Musqua had asked them to take more rations than strictly necessary in case Eric was wrong and they found themselves stuck deep in the white time with a long way to come back and no food to sustain them. Ocek refused to put the village at greater risk. I haven't hunted in this direction for years, he said to Musqua, and so there might be more game. One condition that Ocek had agreed to at Eric's request was that if they came across game, it would be of the four-legged variety. Yeah. If they talk, they walk, she'd said. I mean, they walk, like they get to leave. Get it? I think that's, that's fair enough, right? Yes, he replied. I understand, right? We also have to understand I don't believe Ocek wants to kill and eat any being that walks and talks. But when your people are starving and you understand if you do not bring them something to eat, more people will die, you do things that you never thought that you would do. Okay. Yes, he replied. I understand. They headed south as they had previously, but southwest rather than southeast. So before, if we look on our map, they were here in Mezwa, and they went southeast in this direction. Whoop. And that's where they crossed over the tree bridge. <clears throat> but this time it says they're going southwest. So in this direction. So they're here and they're going this way. Now I wonder if this ice bridge is going to have something to do with the quest that they're on and the sequoia. Mm. But southwest rather than southeast. It made Morgan wonder if the villagers had ever gone north across the barren grounds to hunt. There were woods there too. If there were woods, there might be game, even if, as on her world, it got colder the far farther north you went. Besides, they all had fur, didn't they? But she decided questions about that would have to wait for another time. The weather was cruel again, and having a conversation while walking through it wasn't going to do any good. For the better part of two days, Morgan couldn't see what was different in this direction to keep beings from Mizwa away from it for so long. Years, Ocek had said, the trees were thick and tall. The snow was deep and soft and undisturbed. There were no tracks. It wasn't until the wind started to blow more aggressively on the second day that something began to feel different. It rudely elbowed through the oak and pine trees and caused snow to drift higher than any one of them thought possible, as high as a house back in the city. This, in turn, required the group to take long detours. Morgan realized that the trees were beginning to thin out, 
and the fewer trees there were, the harder the wind blew, and the higher the snow drifted. When they came to the end of the forest, Morgan finally understood why it was that no one came this way any longer. A long and wide field stretched out in front of them, at least as imposing as the barren grounds. And in the distance, a mountain range stretched as far south and north as you could see. The highest peaks reached to the heavens, and even the lowest points looked hard to climb. The mountains looked like a line of sharp, crooked teeth, as if anyone who tried to cross might get eaten alive. They huddled together at the edge of the forest to shield themselves from the wind, with the great field in front of them and the mountains beyond. By this time, the sun was setting, light giving way to dark. Let's see if we can see this mountainous area. Ah, so they are over here and they can see these jagged mountains. Okay, so now Morgan's understanding. She's like, well, of course humans don't come, or the, not humans, pardon me. The beings don't come this way because this is very dangerous and treacherous and inhospitable, right? We can't stop here, Ochek shouted over the wind. He slipped his pack off, took out pieces of dried meat, and handed one to each of the group. We have to keep going until we reach the base of the mountains. At least there we'll have shel shelter. Too bad, Eric said. This is a wonderful place for a picnic. I can see why you didn't go on your own, Morgan said to Eric. Are you kidding, Eric said. It's stupid to go with four, never mind one. She stuck the meat in her mouth and started walking through the field. But if we don't start moving, we'll become our own little mountain range. She was right. In the few minutes they'd been standing there, the snow had already started to creep up higher around their bodies. If they stayed where they were, they'd be swallowed up by one of the snow drifts. You're sure this is the way? Ochek called out to her. Even the great hunter sounded hesitant about what lay ahead. I should hope so, shouldn't I? She called back. <laughs> it felt as if hours had gone by when Ochek stopped. By now it was night. The sky was clear, and the stars and moon painted the snow in a shade of light blue. Morgan, who'd been trailing behind, taking advantage of the path the other three had cut through the snow, arrived last. Oh, crap, she said when she saw what had stopped Ochek. It was the same canyon they'd crossed before, but this time there wasn't a felled tree to help them across. It was far worse. A narrow, let, a narrow bridge of ice lay in front of them, frosted with snow at the edges, but like glass down the middle. A gust of wind, a wrong step, and Morgan pictured herself slipping and falling. She got on her hands and knees, crept to the foot of the bridge, and slid her hands over its surface. It was very slippery. Okay, so now if we look at our picture where they were, they were in this nice open field area, and now they've crossed over this, trying to go towards these mountains, and they're by this ice bridge. Okay. How did this even get here, she asked. Like, a literal ice bridge? Really? In the book she read, it would exist only because of magic. But while there were talking animals on a sky, she was pretty sure there were no ice queens slaying around, manifesting Turkish delights to tempt little boys. There's a nice direct link right there to the Chronicles of Narnia, to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Okay, very interesting. We talked about the connections of, that, of this story, of going to a different realm. Uh, a different universe, a different dimension, just like the Chronicles of Narnia. And just like the Chronicles of Narnia, it seems like the children have something to do with solving the problem. I'm not sure, Ochek said. It has been here since the arrival of the white time. Pardon me, I usually love a good mystery, but it's getting colder. Eric walked to the foot of the bridge. She turned to the group with a smirk then got on all fours. See you on the other side. Just like that, she sprinted across the bridge like an actual squirrel. 
and made it to the other side before anybody else could take a breath. You should be especially careful, Ochek said to Morgan, before he too went on all fours and scampered across with little trouble, only a bit more slowly and less gracefully than Eric. Thanks for the tip, Morgan shouted over the wind. She inched forward again until she could hang her legs over the edge of the canyon on either side of the bridge. She pressed both hands against the surface and was about to shimmy onto the ice, but she stopped and looked up at Eli. Nobody would blame us if we just turned around and decided to like live, you know. We can't just leave them, he said. You know we can't. Morgan looked at the two animal beings standing at the other side of the canyon and watched them intently. They seemed to care for the humans and Morgan had to admit to herself that she was starting to care for them as well. You're right, she said. Plus, I'm not sure I could find my way back and Ochek has all the food anyway. She let Eli go first again. He went the way Morgan intended to go, on his butt, straddling the ice and pulling himself forward bit by bit. Morgan did the same right behind him, concentrating on the back of his head and not looking down. There is no canyon, there is no canyon, there is no canyon, she thought, all the way across. When she got to the other side, she let out a huge breath she hadn't realized she'd been holding. Nobody paused to celebrate. They kept on. The foot of the mountains was close and the travelers were weary. Thankfully, even now the wind was softer and the snow wasn't as deep and it turned out to be the easiest part of their journey. That is until Ochik and Eric knelt down up ahead. They seemed to be involved in some sort of conference, which made Morgan feel very curious. When she and Eli caught up to them, the two, animals be the two animal beings were inspecting a set of animal tracks. Morgan bent down and looked at the prints herself. She was no tracker, but she knew enough to tell that they weren't left there by a two-legged being. They look like they're from a dog or something. Eli looked at them as well. No, they're from a wolf, right, Ochek? Eh hey, Ochek confirmed. They're from a wolf. I'm sorry, Morgan said. A wolf, Eli said. No, I heard him, she said. I just feel like peeing my pants. Oh my, Eric said, your legs would get so cold. It, it was a figure of speech, Morgan explained. So you're not going to... No, she's scared, Eli said. So am I. Then I too may pee my pants, Eric said, but not actually. Enough, Ochek stood and took out his knife. Children, walk close to each other and close to me. I think maybe I'll do the same thing, Eric said, and she even took Ochek's paw. Before long, they came to the base of the mountain range. Their pace had quickened after finding the wolf tracks. There was a good spot to camp where a rock face offered more protection from the wind and they co constructed the hut in record time. All four of them huddled inside and Eli started a fire for supper. The meal consisted of more dried meat and broth but it was good to put anything in their stomachs. Ochek took the occasion to make tea for the group, a mix of pine needles, melted snow, and tree sap. As tea went, it was rather bland, like old peppermint gum, but Morgan wasn't about to complain about the warmth it offered. And it had more taste than dried meat, that was certain. All right, we'll leave that there. Next video will be up shortly. All right, guys, take care.